Okay, everyone, I think we'll get started in the next uh, minute or so. So uh, welcome back, hope you enjoyed lunch. Uh, I don't know if all of you were here for the first two uh, sessions this morning, but we heard from CEOs about cross-border logistics and e-commerce, as well as diversification uh, visions. So we're gonna continue along those two themes. Uh, we're gonna revisit them this afternoon, uh, and we're gonna dive deeper into more tangible strategies and how we can actually implement these visions. So uh, we'll start first with uh, logistics and cross-border e-commerce, and I'll call our panelists up, uh, our experts on this topic. We have uh, Tony uh, Steinke from uh, Head of Global Strategic Partnerships with Zonos, uh, William Shaw, uh, Senior Vice President of Chanel Network uh, in France, and Dr. Fadi Abuharan, Deputy CEO, SPL, and Jan Banyatsky, uh, Supply Chain Coordinator with the UPU. So uh, join me in welcoming our panelists and we'll get the discussion started. Uh, I'll make another quick note if you weren't here this morning that uh, this is really an interactive discussion. So we have someone uh, with a mic on either end of the room. Raise your hand, stand up, let me know if you have questions or if you want to answer any of the questions that we're discussing here about what you're doing and your own strategies um, within your organization. So uh, we'll get started. <laughs> All right, Tony, I'll start with you since uh, you're right here, my first victim. Um, so uh, let's talk a little bit about in times of change, um, how can postal operators really play to their strengths uh, and get close to existing customers and attract new ones in this uh, cross-border space? Yeah, I think it's a great opportunity for Post, being that you're the last mile, you have that connection with customers. I think you're set up in the right space but I do think there's some changes that have to happen. I know that e-commerce is somewhat new over the last 20 years, and we need to start talking their language. So I'll kind of go over a few things that we've seen at Zonos. So she said, I'm Tani Steinke. I'm head of partners at Zonos. Do we have a clicker? Yes, or... it was here. Let me see where it's at. It's my next slide. Yes, thank you. Mm -hmm. Just the green button, I'm assuming. Yep. Okay, perfect. So Zonos is a technology company and we're here to help with the cross-border experience. We are located in the US. We've been in business for over 15 years. We also have an office in Gold Coast, Australia, but we work with thousands of e-commerce merchants and we help them on the front end of their website to help localize that consumer buying experience so that it's easy, it's transparent, they know what the full costs are gonna be. And we just really help close that process because we also work with shipping softwares, carriers, postal, in ensuring that the data is correct, collecting the payment for duties and taxes, and just make sure it's a real end-to-end -end process for that customer and a good one for them. So I don't think it's a secret that e-commerce Although it has slowed in growth, it is still growing. We still see this with our merchants that we're working with today. There's more consumers buying online than ever. I like to use my dad as an example. He always had a flip phone that did nothing until about two years ago. I had to teach him how to use the iPhone for the first time. And now he orders everything online. He never goes into a store. So I think generations, all generations are starting to do online buying. And so we're gonna to continue to see that grow, but it also is, what we're seeing is that the post is losing in its share in that market. And it's because we need to start talking their language and make it easy for them. I am a, one of the reasons that probably Amazon is successful and they've kind of created a monster in me because I buy from Amazon all the time. I know what to expect from them. It's easy. My son, he texted me last night. I was in bed at 10 p.m. He said that he was out of toothpaste. So I went on within three clicks. I have it ordered. When he wakes up this morning in Utah, he's gonna have toothpaste on his doorstep. So I don't actually buy from Amazon because they're the cheapest or anything like that. I buy from Amazon because it's so easy for me. I can do, you know, it's localized to me. I know what I can expect from them. I keep buying from them over and over again. 
Well, for online merchants, this is hard to create that same buying experience for customers on e-commerce sites. Because a lot of these e-commerce sites, they're not set up for that international customer. So Shopify, for example. It may localize to the customer, but it doesn't always show the total cost of shipping, what the duties and taxes are. A lot of times customers get onto a website and they have no idea if that company even ships to their country. And so it just makes it a tough buying experience. And when you have 90% of your business is domestic and 10% is cross-border, it makes it really hard for these online retailers to put focus into what that experience looks like. But I am an online retailer myself. So I have a coffee subscription business. It's on Shopify. I co-own it with um, another lady and she's really good at focused on our product, you know, where we get our beans from, what our packaging looks like, all of that. So that leaves the rest of the business to me. So I have to do the technology. I have to create the website. I have to work on the customer experience. I also do finances, which is really scary for us, but I do handle the finances as well. And it's impossible for me to know all of that and be an expert in it. So I have to focus my time in certain areas and use partners to do other things. I personally focus on the customer experience because that's important. It's a subscription business, so I need customers coming back over and over again, and I need to create that buying experience for them. That leaves a gap in my supply chain because I have to figure out shipping. And for someone who hadn't done shipping in the past, it was really important that I turned to partners who came in and gave me the easy button. And that's what these customers want. They want you to come in and tell them how to do this, how to make it easy, how to be plug and play on their site. And I know that's something that's super important for me in my supply chain business. So customer experience matters to e-commerce. Lifetime value matters. If I don't get customers coming back to me, it's no good. If you come and make one coffee order, I don't make any money. So I need them to come back over and over again. And by the way, for my coffee business, it's 90% of them come back and are repeat buyers. So we do a really good job at communicating with our customers and keeping that, uh, that experience well. So what are some of the challenges that Post run into and logistics companies run into? Well, duties and taxes, knowing what that is going to be, being able to communicate that and actually collect that payment, being able to have the correct data, which by the way, this is not all on the online retailer's fault or on the Post's fault why we don't have good data. But as I said earlier, the technology, the platforms aren't always set up for that right customer experience, but it's also not set up for the data. So let's say that I have a 10 to 14 digit HS code. That doesn't mean that my e-commerce platform, I can put that in the, in the back end. And if I do, it doesn't mean it's gonna transfer to the shipping software. And I also learned this year, just because I give information to USPS, for example, in a field and they read it, that does not mean that they pass that information to the receiving post. So having the correct data is going to be an issue that we have to fix throughout the entire process and everybody has to have a piece of that. And then having ICS2 and different things come up with uh, all the changes that happen with countries, these are really hard for e-commerce merchants to know and how we can um, continue to work with that. I think that went, there it goes. Okay, so duties and taxes. How does it work today? Well, the express carriers are the ones for DDP who really figured it out in the first place, right? If I'm UPS, I send the package, UPS clears it through customs, they deliver it to the customer and they turn around and they build the, the online retailer or the shipper or a third party, whoever that is. Well, the problem is, is express carriers are expensive and they have a lot of fees with them. And they haven't figured out how to get it on the front end for the e-commerce platform either. So then you had the freight forwarders and consolidators who came in and, and they figured out how to do the same thing, but a little bit cheaper. They don't charge as many fees and then they inject it into the post and, and you guys typically, typically do the uh, final mile delivery, not always. So how is that an area that we can improve and get a piece of it? DDP is the right choice for customers because they want to know what that cost is up front. They don't want to be surprised when they hit the door. Online retailers don't want to have to deal with abandoned packages. They uh, also want to provide that customer experience and this would help open up new markets for post. You, to be competitive, you have to have a DDP option and those consolidators or freight forwarders, they're clearing commercially and then they inject it into the post, right? So how can we change that experience for them? 
It's important that we use partnerships to do that because this isn't gonna happen for Post unless everybody works together. It's not one person who can do it. It has to be everyone working together. Sonos uses AI through really all parts of our company. If you get an email from me, it probably was written by AI. And that's not just for Zonos, but that's for my coffee business as well. And so I think this is an opportunity that everyone can look at what their processes are, what tasks you're doing daily, and how you can use um, AI to help you build it. Because it's not going to change the world and it's not going to do everything, but it is going to help save us time and give us more pro productivity. So uh, I know I'm running out of time, so I'm going to make this slide quick. Um, with ICS2, and I already talked about how important data is, with HS codes, remember it's not all the online retailers' fault that they don't have it, but they're not experts at cross-border trade, and we have to be able to give them the tools to be able to know what the HS codes are, how to get the information to the right place. Zonos does this today with our customers by Anyone who signs up with us, we give them 10,000 free classifications. So we're trying to fix the data on the front end, but also working with companies like USPS, um, APPC, who's here, I know sits here today, but how do we build out this DDP solution? How do we give you the correct data um, to also have and help clear that order through customs? So I'm out of time, and that was my last slide. My contact information's here if you have any questions. Thanks, Tony. Yeah, I think it's really important that you mentioned the DDP product because this is something that when we were talking about the overall vision this morning in this topic, you know, we came back to customer centricity a lot and how it needs to be easy for the customer and how we need to post need to be there to really facilitate that cross-border trade and uh, business for them um, so they don't just fade away into the background when it comes to that market. Um, but this is an this is a topic that we didn't really dive deep into and how are posts doing with developing a GDP product around the world? Um, so yeah, we can come back to that uh, later in the discussion. Um, William, uh, a very important date is coming up, which is 11-11, which in Cologne, where I live, is uh, the start of carnival season. But um, for Chanyal Network, this is the biggest shopping day sure. of the year. So um, how do you pre prepare for this huge day uh, to cope with the volume boom uh, during the peak season? Sure, sure. I mean, uh, very glad to be here. Uh, this is William Shum. Uh, I'm a senior vice president for Chanyal. And later on, I will introduce a little bit about who Chanyao is and how we deal with uh, the, the uh, overall challenges and also opportunities uh, for the cross-border logistics. Okay, sure, a little bit uh, about Chanyao. So Chanyao was established 10 years ago um, as the logistic infrastructure for Alibaba Group. So today, we are the largest uh, cross-border logistics provider uh, globally, and we help uh, the platforms uh, within Alibaba ecosystem and also external customers to uh, make their cross-border e-commerce deliveries fast and also easy. Um, so today, uh, we create uh, very diverse uh, solutions for international logistics, including cross-border express delivery. So we have the what we call a $5 uh, 10 days delivery, and also we have a $10 5 days de delivery. So from all those key offerings that we definitely find that these are the offerings that are specifically designed for the cross-border e-commerce because it is not probably not as fast as the, uh, the premium uh, commercial providers, but it is uh, with a very uh, reasonable uh, and fast uh, lead time and also very affordable. Uh, at the same time that we also uh, create our global supply chain by uh, allowing merchants to pre-allocate their inventories globally so that we can local, uh, offer a local delivery experience. For example, in a lot of the European countries, uh, through our so-called overseas and imported warehouse solutions, we can offer uh, the delivery within the next day. And in order to support our cross-border express delivery and also uh, the import and export uh, warehouses, we also started to launch uh, some of the local express delivery services in key countries. For example, uh, if we take Spain as an example, right now we are offering the local deliveries in Spain by ourselves um, by leveraging the next day delivery. That can be the last mile delivery and also uh, be the last mile service for our overseas warehouse. 
Uh, we have a significant business in China. Uh, that's where we grow together with the Alibaba ecosystem and uh, really enable and empower uh, the Double uh, Eleven Shopping Festival. So uh, we have very experienced uh, capabilities to really enable those uh, very significant uh, uplift during those uh, uh, shopping festivals. And we have developed uh, very sophisticated solutions empowered by our technology solutions to really pre-allocate a lot of the resources so that we uh, can make sure that we ensure the fast delivery even for uh, the major campaigns. And uh, besides the e express and logistics related services, we also create uh, a lot of the technology solutions. For example, we operate the largest out of the home uh, delivery network in China with uh, around uh, 170,000 uh, portal networks across uh, China. That's the biggest network in the world. And also we run uh, the biggest uh, logistics uh, APP in the world uh, with uh, uh, more than 30 million uh, active uh, users on a daily basis. And we also create uh, the logistic technologies that um, will support our own operation and also we create those solutions for our close partners. I think this is uh, what Chinese are doing. So we are um, primarily focusing on global and cross-border logistics and we have significant and high quality deliveries and supply chain solutions in China and offer technologies and also other uh, infrastructures. Um, so particularly in Europe and Southeast Asia, why we group these two uh, regions together is really we have very significant uh, overseas consumers here. And we uh, have been investing heavily in terms of uh, infrastructures, both supporting our cross-border business and also our local networks. So for example, uh, we run uh, significant e-hubs uh, in Liege and in Malaysia, and also we have significant uh, sorting centers to support our cross-border business, and also uh, very significant local networks across Europe. I think all these are infrastructures that support our smooth deliveries during uh, the major campaigns. So if we talk about the Double Eleven, we have been organizing and preparing for that even three months before the, the campaign day. So we pre-organize a lot of the charter flights, uh, working very closely with all the last mile delivery partners in terms of planning for their deliveries and also uh, enable our sophisticated technologies to make sure that all those uh, plans can be executed effectively. Um, particularly, we are enhancing our last mile network in Europe, uh, specifically, for example, Spain, France, and Poland. And also, we work closely with our partners, Lazada Express, in Southeast Asia. Um, global supply chain is also a key part that we believe uh, will be uh, very critical for the global delivery. I think cross-border uh, five days delivery is already uh, much faster than before. But uh, if we want uh, some of the even more uh, extreme services, for example, next day delivery, we have to have a local warehouse. So that's why we create quite a lot of uh, uh, warehouses um, in Europe, both for import purpose and also for export purpose. So for import, uh, we pre-allocate a lot of the inventories from um, elsewhere um, in Europe so that when consumers are ready to make the order, we can deliver on a next day basis. So we started to offer the next day service uh, in Spain and later on we will expand that to Germany, to France, to UK and also uh, to uh, uh, Czech Republic. Um, and also we build quite an extensive network to help uh, the Europe exporters um, to um, uh, serve uh, their customers overseas. So particularly in uh, Asia, we have millions of uh, square meters warehouse in China and also in Southeast Asia, and really helping the European uh, and also US uh, exporters to serve their overseas customers in Asia. Um, we are a technology company. Uh, we have very significant investment in technology capabilities. For example, uh, we run uh, probably the largest unmanned vehicle fleet. Uh, so today we have around uh, 800 unmanned vehicles um, serving uh, some of the last mile deliveries, particularly in campus, uh, university campuses, because we find this is an operational environment with a lot of tech-savvy consumers and also a very uh, uh, relatively easier operating environment uh, for the unmanned vehicles. 
um, we self uh, develop significant sortation uh, automations and also IOTs and digital supply chains. We even uh, um, provide uh, smart last miles, uh, namely lockers and also uh, IoT devices for uh, pickup and delivery uh, portal networks. So I think these are some of the technologies that we definitely first uh, establishing our internal operating environment uh, as a key differentiator to really create uh, faster delivery with uh, even lower cost and also can support double eleven in a much more efficient ways. And also we create those solutions for our close customers. Um, together we help them to uh, implement those technologies, particularly in the logistics and supply chain uh, areas, uh, not only for the logistics providers, but also for a lot of the uh, brands in terms of uh, consumer brands and also industrial brands. The last but least uh, is really about green logistics. So we definitely understand uh, we have a significant uh, commitment to uh, green logistics and also to our ESG initiatives. For example, we create uh, most of our logistics parks in a sustainable way. For example, we install significant solar uh, energy systems on most of our logistics parks. And also we in, uh, introduced uh, significant uh, green delivery options. For example, for our span last mile delivery, we introduce quite a lot of electric vehicles delivery uh, for those uh, areas. We believe that the zero emission uh, um, commitment is something that we definitely need to uh, um, create as our commitment for the local community. And the last but not least is really about our sustainable last mile solutions. We believe the uh, smart lockers and uh, portal networks would be a more effective way for consumers to welcome their parcels. So this is also an area that we invest a lot and also we work closely with a lot of partners. I think this is a little bit about ourselves. So um, uh, as a quick summary, so we are a global leader in the cross-border delivery area by offering cross-border express delivery, cross-border supply chain, and also we invest significantly in on selected countries' last mile delivery. And we are a technology company with a significant uh, ESC commitment. And we definitely want to work together with all our partners um, to really uh, create uh, the green deliveries uh, in Europe and in Southeast Asia. I think this is uh, what we are actually doing. We definitely believe uh, it's not only serving the double 11 with enough capacity and also good service level. It's really create that in a even more sustainable ways. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Yeah, I think um, that this idea of partnerships is an interesting point to touch on uh, later on when we start the discussion because we've talked about this earlier in the day. Um, and you mentioned that you're setting up local delivery in places like Spain. So it'd be interesting to talk about that further, where it makes sense to have partners and where it makes sense to set up your, your own network. Yeah. Um, Fadi, uh, National Post are increasingly working with the private sector. So we've, again, this theme of having partnerships to manage this uh, complex supply chain. Um, what are the advantages of this approach from your perspective? First of all, thank you, uh, Amanda, and good afternoon, everyone. It's always a pleasure to be uh, back on the on stage here in this event, and a big thank you to the uh, the organizers of the of the expo as well as the UPU World uh, Leaders Forum. Um, just getting the slides up there. Uh, the the partnership with the private sector uh, players, Amanda, for for the SPL group of companies has been, uh, I would say, foundational to to our strategy. The strategy that we we founded and established back in 2019. This morning, uh, we were fortunate to have His Excellency, the President of Saudi Post, SPL, um, shed some light on, on, on pieces of that strategy, and I'll hopefully build on, on some of that. But when we, when we go back to, to 2019, uh, four and a half years ago, our strategy was built on two fundamental pil pillars, an organic side and an inorganic side. The, um, the organic um, aspect of our strategy is, um, is, is probably what we saw uh, many programs of work uh, being implemented over the course of 2019 to 2022, um, pretty much, and it's still ongoing. The inorganic uh, pillars of our strategy is something that we embarked upon in terms of execution uh, last year. And there's a variety of different examples that I'll, I'll, I'll shed some light on at a high level, and then I'm going to zoom in on, on one opportunity that we are uh, about to embark on very shortly. 
Um, but when we look at the private sector, once again, we look at the private sector from the perspective of growing um, at a much faster pace and a more efficient and effective manner, um, and relying and leveraging on the expertise and capability that these private sector players bring. Uh, yes, we are proud of the talent that we have, we're proud of the know-how that we have, but we don't know everything. Um, and yes, we can spend time on, 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 on learning and building, but how can we fast track that and how can we leverage um, the, the ecosystem around us to, to fast track that and bring the best of the best to the table. So if we go back in history, Saudi Post back in 2006 um, started this whole venture of, of working with the private sector and they established a, a joint venture company with a private sector um, player um, and established a company which exists today called Naqil. Um, I'm, I'm currently the acting CEO of Naqil in addition to, to a few other roles that I play across the, the, the group of companies. Um, just last year, we completed the acquisition, the remaining acquisition of shares of Naqil, and we now are proud owners of 100% of that company. However, the private sector partner for, uh, for those many years brought know-how, brought capability, brought expertise to the table. Um, and Naqil um, today is absolutely not the Naqil it was back in 2006. Um, and a big thanks and appreciation goes to the capability um, that that partner brought, brought to the table. Um, another example um, that we announced last year, and I was, I was very proud to, and excited to announce this on stage last year um, at the event, was the launch of Infinite PL. Um, and Infinite PL, uh, once again, is another joint venture partnership that we established with the private sector. Uh, we own 55% and our private sector partner owns 45%. And it is solely um, designed to develop digital um, and uh, technological platforms for the logistics sector at large. So once again, when we look at building our joint ventures with private sector, we're not just looking at it to say, what is this organization going to do for SPL? Rather, how can we actually create a new entity? How can we create a new um, organization that can cater and serve the needs at the market at large? So yes, it can help enable SPL, but more importantly, what can it do for the market? Um, and that's, that's something that I, I really want to make clear to, to the audience here. When we look at these JVs here, uh, once again, yes, they do provide some um, enablement to SPL, but at large, they're there for, for the market. Another example that we launched last year as part of our inorganic strategy is, is Parcelat. Um, and that, once again, is another partnership that we joined forces with the private sector. We own 50%, they own 50%. And that's primarily focused on building a network of parcel stations um, that will be um, scattered across the kingdom, um, several thousand of them within, within a few years, um, and ultimately going out to the region as well. And there, once again, the, the reason we went um, and, and built Parcelat was not for SPL's purpose, but rather how can we enable the, the, the logistics ecosystem um, at large and, and provide enablement for other players, even our competitors, to actually go out and, and leverage this, this network and these technologies. But today, I'm, I'm extremely excited um, to, to announce a, 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 a new strategic relationship that uh, we, will, we, will, we are in the final stages of formalizing uh, with, our, with our partners, uh, GN Tech, um, Global, Global Network Technology. Um, and this partnership is something that, once again, similar example, not here just to enable SPL, uh, but more importantly, um, enable postal operators globally um, and connecting the dots uh, across the ecosystem. So GN Tech, um, and I'm very happy and proud that we have, we have our colleagues from GN Tech here with us today as well, um, is designed uh, to be a digital platform um, to connect postal operators, connect aggregators, connect airline carriers, connect uh, couriers, various players and stakeholders across the ecosystem, across the global supply chain, all on one platform, where rather than connecting the dots individually on a one-to-one -one basis between your entity and another entity, you plug into this platform, and once you're plugged into this platform, you have access to everyone else and the entire ecosystem of stakeholders built into there so that you can actually orchestrate and manage an entire global supply chain from A to Z. Um, it's basically a virtual aggregator um, type of platform um, and will, would provide significant value 
and be a significant um, value proposition to any postal operator globally, um, let alone everyone else and, and any other stakeholder connected to it. So once again, extremely proud um, and, and excited um, to embark on this, this partnership and this relationship with GN Tech. Um, and once again, this is not for SPL. Yes, SPL can leverage this platform, but it is here for everyone else across the globe to leverage um, and maximize the benefit. If we want to zoom in on, on what GN Tech is going to add to, to us specifically in KSA, and we talk about Vision 2030, um, and those of you that don't know about Vision 2030 in the kingdom, I, 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 I encourage you all to read more about it because it is probably one of the most ambitious, it's not probably, it is the most ambitious transformation um, plan that any country um, and geography has embarked upon, at least in the history of my time. Um, and it, it really, it's, it's cross-cutting across a number of industries, a number of pillars. But when we talk about Vision 2030, the logistics um, component is crucial. Um, using KSA as a global hub, connecting the East and the West is fundamental to our transformation, fundamental to Vision 2030. What does GN Tech Platform give us? It's going to connect the globe um, across the stakeholders and allow us within the kingdom to go about and become that, that global logistics connector um, and, and connecting the East to the West uh, across a variety of aspects of the global supply chain. Once again, not only will it help us in SPL, but any other operator within the kingdom in in the region um, and across the globe at large. If I want, just to zoom in a little bit and give you a, a little bit of, um, of understanding, and I'm not the expert um, on, on the uh, logistics information system, but once again, if you do have any questions, please feel free to, to talk to my colleagues uh, afterwards. Um, but it consists of a number of different modules, and I think two in particular um, that, that, that make this unique uh, on top of uh, all of the other modules is the AI forecasting. And you know, we talk about AI a lot, artificial intelligence, um, but the artificial intelligence uh, aspect and component of this platform uh, will help from a variety of aspects, um, one of which is, is prediction um, and, and forecasting. So you know, how can we actually predict how volumes are moving around from place to place and how can you as couriers, if you are a courier or a postal operator, get ready um, to understand those volumes in terms of when they're coming, when they're flowing, etc., so that you are in, in good shape uh, to, 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 to get ready for those volumes and cater those needs. The carbon calculator, once again, um, you know, in, in, in 2023, as we talk about um, you know, everyone um, being uh, sustainable and green, this, once again, will help organizations, whoever they are across the global supply chain, to, to understand their overall emissions calculations from end to end across that, that supply chain as well. I think in summary, the, um, the, the GN Tech uh, partnership with Infinite PL um, is, is really going to help our customers or their customers um, to provide that agility, speed to market, um, improve their overall service quality, um, and most importantly, really grow the cross-border e-commerce movement. Um, and that has been fundamental to the discussions we had this morning, this afternoon. Um, and we absolutely know that this aspect of e-commerce and cross-border e-commerce within the kingdom, within the region, is only going, is only at, at its early stages and is only going to have a steep curve uh, over, over the years uh, and decades to come. Ultimately, last but not least, connecting the overall delivery ecosystem across that global supply chain in an efficient, effective manner. Um, um, plugging into one platform, getting done with it, and moving on with your business and focusing on growth. I'll conclude Great. there. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Perfect. Um, yeah, looking forward to hearing more about uh, GN Tech and also the, your approach with joint ventures. Really interesting. Um, okay, we have uh, Jan Vonyansky here again with uh, UPU. So um, can you tell us a little bit more about, uh, Tony talked earlier about HS codes and this kind of regulatory, uh, these regulatory borders, when uh, <laughs> bottlenecks when it comes to cross-border logistics. Uh, can you tell us uh, how changes like EAD um, are putting additional burdens on the postal supply chain and specifically the UPU's perspective on how it's managing the reg readiness of this? Thank you very much. Uh, uh, good afternoon to all. It's not easy for me after the lunch break and such a, uh, great uh, previous speakers to continue, but I will do my best, be short, uh, uh, and introduce some activities uh, which uh, uh, are already managed by International Bureau of UPU to help designated operators with their uh, uh, business and e-commerce business especially. Uh, 
I don't want to speak too much about some figures. I don't want to speak too much about the uh, details of some latest technologies like artificial intelligence or something like that. But of course, I'd like to uh, present some, some activities uh, which were already done or are ongoing uh, to help uh, to improve supply chain or logistics uh, of uh, UPU designated operators. Uh, and so I will focus on some. Uh, uh, I, uh, I will focus on some activities, which I grouped to three different uh, areas. Uh, we were listening today morning a lot about the data, data management, about uh, more flexible networks and new products and services. Uh, I could provide more examples, but I will uh, mention just two, or one or two examples in, uh, from each of these uh, area in my uh, in my slides. Uh, sometimes uh, uh, I will focus on activities which are uh, uh, which are the most important to to react on uh, on uh, key drivers uh, uh, these days. Like uh, we have heard about data management, digitalization, about artificial intelligence, and, and cooperation, and many others. Uh, but I'd like to say that sometimes for for UPU is uh, the biggest challenge not to find the right way uh, to, to recognize the trends uh, or maybe develop tools. The, the biggest challenge sometimes is to, uh, to uh, implement it in all countries because UPU is a global network. We would like to be global and uh, uh, we, we need to find solutions which are feasible and uh, uh, possible to implement in all countries around the world. This is the biggest, change, uh, the biggest challenge uh, sometimes. Uh, so uh, uh, I'd like to uh, say that uh, we are very proud that during the last two years we implemented, we call it global postal model or implementation of electronic advanced data exchange, which is very important to meet all uh, legal uh, EAD requirements coming from different industries, uh, countries. Uh, and uh, I'm very proud that uh, during the last two years we really uh, make all designated operators capable to exchange data with all supply chain stakeholders. We think it's extremely important uh, to exchange data with customs, with uh, designated operators, with uh, supply chain partners like carriers, uh, handling agents, and so on and so on. I can say that after uh, many, many capacity building activities, uh, uh, we uh, are now ready to exchange this data. Uh, the biggest challenge for us was implementation of ICS2. Uh, already mentioned earlier from 2nd of October, I can say that uh, uh, no, uh, no mail was stopped until now. So uh, I can say that I'm very proud, and as you can see on the screen, uh, uh, more than 200 designated operators. It means nearly all of them around the world are capable to transmit uh, customs uh, data, item level data. Uh, as you can see, we have uh, nearly 190 designated operators which are able to send consignment level data to their carriers. We have uh, uh, nearly 90 carriers around the world exchanging data electronically with POS and uh, uh, this is really great progress. We, we organized last week uh, a meeting with uh, IATA, UPU webinar, and uh, the, the carriers really thanked a lot to post that they, they, they managed that in such a, a, a quick uh, uh, and short time. Uh, I'd like uh, also to mention that uh, uh, this, uh, this global postal model is, uh, is uh, uh, po uh, transport neutral, so we are ready uh, also to communicate with uh, surface transport uh, providers, and we already do uh, with sea operators, with uh, uh, road operators, not only with air carriers. Uh, and I hope that this data exchange will help us, uh, uh, will help us, there is one slide missing, doesn't matter. Uh, I'd like to say that uh, uh, the main focus these days is also on uh, not only data exchange, but uh, data quality, because we want to use this data for many different analyses for uh, maybe seamless processes, paper-free processes. So uh, now the main focus is on, on, on uh, data compliance uh, to be able to, uh, to um, move, as I said, to paper-free transport, to paper-free accounting, paper-free uh, custom clearance. And we are able to do that with data which, are, uh, which we are able to collect uh, uh, and transmit now. Uh, I would like to say that uh, mm, uh, to support uh, these uh, uh, transport activities, uh, we would like to, I don't know what's happened, I'm, I apologize, but the slides are not in the order I, I prepared. And I'm looking for, yeah, this is this one. Uh, so uh, uh, I'd like to mention also uh, uh, that uh, 
we recognize, and COVID was really good lessons learned for us, that uh, we are depending too much on passenger flights. The posts are depending too much on passenger flights. So now we are much more open to cooperate with uh, cargo carriers. We are more open to discuss and pilot maybe with integrators and with others uh, to be more flexible. Uh, in uh, some regions like Caribbean and Pacific, uh, we already uh, help designated oper operators to optimize their network, to speak to their carriers, regional, small regional carriers, to help them be, uh, become uh, EDA capable, uh, uh, to consolidate mail somewhere in the mail hubs, in regional mail hubs, and we would like to continue uh, 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 later connect these regional hubs uh, globally in the close cooperation with vital, we call it vital postal sector players. It means uh, private companies, because uh, uh, we, as I said, we were depending too much on uh, passenger uh, carriers, which was not the best strategy. Uh, I'd like to say that uh, uh, cooperation with, uh, with uh, uh, other supply chain partners, private operators, uh, is extremely important for us for the future. Uh, uh, to be honest, I must say that we are not as important as used to be for carriers uh, because the volumes uh, in the traditional postal uh, stream are lower. So we need to try to understand each other much better than before. We should not be so uh, uh, sometimes so strict as before. Uh, and we need to uh, find the uh, language to, together, to, to, to discuss together and harmonize processes uh, 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 to make a business. Uh, I'd like to mention also uh, that, uh, that, my, that uh, uh, this is really, I'm, I apologize, this is old version of slides, so I, I'm skipping uh, some of them. Uh, I'd like to mention that uh, the cooperation is not only uh, focused on uh, in the area of transport, but uh, uh, previous speakers mentioned uh, uh, cooperation in the area of uh, last mile delivery, that posts, uh, posts are uh, um, uh, delivering items in the country of destinations. But we would like to uh, be more uh, open to cooperate with carriers in uh, international transport, as I mentioned earlier, in the last mile delivery, but also in, in, uh, in uh, direct injections, it means in first mile delivery. We see the trends that uh, uh, the, the typical or, or core postal D2C model is, uh, is changing dramatically, uh, or not changing, it's changed now. It's, it's clear that now uh, the mail is, uh, uh, our goods are uh, shipped uh, as in containers as a cargo to uh, to uh, warehouses uh, in abroad and then um, sometimes uh, uh, the postal networks are used for delivery in the last mile sometimes not so we need to find a solution also for b2b uh, to c uh, service and uh, uh, we would like also to uh, uh, work more uh, to prepare uh, um, to prepare cooperation with other stakeholders, and a uh, uh, very interesting business model could be a uh, uh, model uh, which we call Postal Prosperity Zone, which uh, in which we would like to connect uh, designated operators, uh, customs, uh, uh, World Free Zone organization uh, to prepare model to help uh, designated operators uh, use all uh, data which we are able to exchange tools which we already prepared uh, uh, to, uh, to help them with e-commerce uh, in some specific regions. Thank you very much, and I apologize for uh, all the version of slides. Fine, thank you, Jan. That's a, quite a lot of initiatives there uh, that you mentioned the UP doing and, and quite large as well. Um, I have some, uh, we'll continue discussing and I have some qu follow-up questions for the panelists, but I just also wanted to give anyone an opportunity that had a question at the moment now uh, to follow up on with any of the presentations that you saw. Uh, we have someone with the mic here and here, so just uh, stand up uh, so I can see you better if, if you do have a question. And if not, we'll move on. Okay. Um, Tony, you spoke about this DDP product and um, in this whole world of 
HS codes and regulations and to even think about establishing a DDP product and how to navigate that, especially if once you put the systems in place to assign a product uh, a number, um, that that information isn't passed on uh, between all the carriers or all the all the chains uh, that are involved along the way. So where where does a post even start when it comes to a strategy for a DDP product? Yeah, definitely. I think it, I already mentioned earlier, it has to be the post working together. Because if you have like, let's just take USPS for example, who says, okay, I wanna do DDP into you know, whatever country, maybe it's into the UK. Well, now you need Royal Mail to say, okay, I'll accept the DDP and I'll help you with billing. So I would say the hardest part about DDP for post today is collecting of the money and getting at that in the right place. Um, today you're having to collect from the end consumer. So it'll be actually faster if you can collect it ahead of time, but just being able to take that package and know this package is going to be DDP and we're going to build the shipper for it is probably, I think, where you start of knowing how to acknowledge what package is going to be DDP and then being able to collect that payment. So I think that's the hardest part is figuring out what package it is that needs to be DDP and how to bill it. The rest of it, customers are used to it, shippers are used to it, they're doing it with the express carriers today. So it's just being able to recognize the package. And how are, um, how are some of your, your customers dealing with this now as far as, is it just one-on-one uh, -on -one relationships with other posts or how are they approaching it, uh, you know, by biggest market first or uh, what have you seen some best practices there? And Jan, maybe you can chime in as well with this and maybe the UPU's role in, in facilitating DDP products for posts. Yeah, I think it does start with markets first, because if you take like, if you're shipping into the US, you know, we have a really high de minimis of 800. So most of post shipments are below that. And then you run into state tax, so it's a little bit different. So that's not a country that you'd have to focus on right away. Whereas shipping into say like Brazil, who does collect it often, that's one that you'd want to set up. So I do think it's picking countries that it's a need for. Definitely coming into Europe with IOS, it makes it a little bit easier if someone's filing IOS and paying that way. So it's picking certain countries that you see at first. And that is one of the ways that like um, APPC that we're working with is looking at intra, <clears throat> excuse me, Asia. And then also with USPS picking certain lanes that they can trial it and be able to set up the system to be able to push outward. Great, great. Thank you. Uh, Jan, do you have any perspective um, uh, from the UPU side of things on uh, best practices for post and facilitating a, a DDP product? Uh, no, I, I, I cannot share some such, uh, such information now, but we are now preparing uh, uh, cooperation with uh, companies to, to help us with DDPP. I, I, I know that uh, there are already uh, many designated operators uh, doing that. Uh, but now we were focused on, on uh, 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 implementation of electronic advanced data first uh, to, uh, to help all designated operators be able to, to, pro to, to transmit some data first. Uh, and uh, from the data, of course, it's much e with this data, we, it's much easier now uh, to, uh, to prepare also the next steps like, like DDP. Great, great. Um, uh, William and Fadi as well, we, I heard a little bit about um, uh, Chanel being a tech company and that you develop a lot of this in-house. And then you have the approach in Saudi of doing this uh, joint venture structure uh, to develop uh, tech products. So it'd be great to hear a little bit more from you on uh, is everything developed in-house as far as your own internal technology and when you see um, when you see opportunities there to work with other partners, and then Fadi as well, how the whole joint venture model started, um, and you know how that's changed over time. Sure, I think we um, we, we develop quite a lot of uh, core technologies in house because we believe first uh, the logistic industry definitely is an industry that technology plays a very critical part uh, from several different dimensions. I think first is regarding connectivities, because today I think we operate uh, the largest cross-border e-commerce delivery network, and there we work with uh, hundreds of partners 
across line haul charter flights, uh, like passenger belly PSAs, the last mile delivery, postal, and uh, commercial providers. And by connecting all of that, I think there are quite a lot of key technologies are really getting uh, leveraged. Uh, and that's not only uh, for the systems, for the uh, artificial intelligence, but also for some of the hard technologies. For example, right now we are leveraging quite a significant portion of our RFID in the cross-border uh, transportation because that we, we, we put the RFID on our um, uh, the, the big bags uh, of parcels and then when the, uh, the bags uh, across uh, different uh, uh, operation nodes, I think it will quickly get uh, read it uh, without uh, a lot of uh, manual uh, kind of uh, operations so that it will be much more efficient. Uh, I think a lot of the areas that we need to really make sure that we have the end-to-end -end in, uh, embedded technologies uh, working very well together so that we can enhance the cross-border end-to-end uh, -end efficiencies. But uh, to some of the other extent, we also work very closely with a lot of partners. For example, uh, for a lot of the uh, hard devices, uh, if we believe that it is um, kind of uh, something that we can work together with a lot of the component providers, a lot of the uh, uh, OEMs, and we will uh, be very much willing to do so. At the same time, that from a lot of the uh, network establishment, uh, we're also working very closely with our partners. For example, we had a joint venture with uh, DHR in uh, Poland so that we jointly develop the last mile portal and local networks. I think this is also an area that we believe that by creating an even bigger ecosystem that we can benefit each other in terms of consolidating some of the volumes and also have a much better cooperation in some of the key countries. So we definitely remain open uh, on all, all of those uh, cooperations, no matter whether it is uh, uh, trying to integrate uh, with some of the other providers or us being integrated in some of the uh, kind of end-to-end -end solutions or create uh, strategic partnership and even uh, joint ventures with uh, players in some of the key areas. Great, thank you. Um, so, so great question, Amanda. And um, I, I come from a tech background, so apologies if I get extremely um, excited and passionate about um, how I address this. But there's a number of parts to your question. If we go back to Saudi Post um, originally, um, Saudi Post, Legacy um, absolutely was building all their technology in-house um, and we still operate on a lot of those legacy systems today um, However, we're in the process of transitioning and migrating off those um, and we have a very clear digital um, Tech roadmap to, to get us from where we are to uh, where the future lies when we um, Go back in you know in time about two and a half years ago uh, before we took the decision to establish infinite PL which is our, our digital um, tech joint venture uh, establishment. We, uh, we took that decision after really looking at um, what options we had. And the reality was our, our IT department within Saudi Post, um, yes, was built on legacy, has a lot of great talent, a lot of good capability. Um, but the reality is, is when you look at legacy applications that have been built um, many, many years ago, um, there's only so much more that you can do to get them enhanced and enhanced and take it to the next level. And the reality is, is the business that we are operating today is not the business we were operating when these systems were built and established. So they weren't necessarily designed to be um, scalable from the perspective of the business that we are in today, right? Um, absolutely, if we want to continue being a postal operator, um, it can cater for that. But we are no longer a postal operator, right? Post is... Um, Part of our business, but a very small part of our business, um, and the, the you know the world has changed and evolved. So, we had options. We either say we take what we have um, and try to you know bolt fix it and, and get it enhanced, which is probably going to be more um, inefficient um, and cost prohibitive, not the most economical way. Um, we could go to a managed service provider and outsource um, our, our tech um, to a third party and just basically you know pay them for a fee. Or we could um, partner with a company and say, well, how can we design technologies as platforms to serve the needs of SPL, but also serve the needs of the market at large, and rather than it being a, a, a bleeding cost center, making it a profit center and sharing the pie with a partner. Um, so for us, it was, it was truly a no-brainer decision. 
Um, we were very fortunate to find our partners in, in Ride Digital that um, believed in our ambition, believed in our vision, believed in the transformation the kingdom was uh, was undergoing. And um, you know, I think very very quickly we we were able to to um, you know join hands, shake hands, and establish this partnership. We 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 launched Infinite PL um, just a year ago, and and today um, we have a team of over uh, 60, 60 plus individuals. Um, we have a number of partner organizations that we work with across the globe. Um, and we are also taking in uh, a lot of our great talent from the legacy IT department and transitioning them into Infinite PL. But what Infinite PL gives them is it gives them a clear focus on tech and digital. So this no longer becomes a back office function within an enterprise organization where you know you have all these other functions that you need to manage and prioritize. This now becomes a priority. Um, and the reality is if we want to be a leading player in the industry that we are in, we absolutely need to take technology and leverage technology and digital, embrace it um, with full open arms um, to take us to that next level because there's no way that we will be able to compete um, in today's world without without that enablement and without that continuous agility um, and investment. So what, what this partnership gives us is that focus, that priority focus um, where digital is front and center and key. Um, and will hopefully not only reap the benefits for SPL, but more importantly, create um, a whole big market opportunity for Infinite PL um, to, to not only enable SPL, but enable every single other player in the kingdom and globally um, to, to take them to another level in, in digital. And once again, the, what I announced today about our partnership with, with GN Tech um, under, under Infinite PL is only another example and a great testament to how serious and how focused we are on on digital um, and we're not just saying we now need to do everything ourselves within infinite pl but how can we also within infinite pl partner with other organizations um, to leverage the best of the best across the ecosystem and always bring that to the table so i think in conclusion answering your question um, do we do we do things in-house yes legacy wise we did we absolutely are not doing that today. We absolutely know that in order to win and to remain competitive um, and to continue to excel, we cannot do it on our own. And even though we've, we've established a joint venture, we're not still saying within the joint venture, we're gonna do these things within a closed wall. We are absolutely uh, open to doing business with any partner out there that can complement the talent that we have to complement the capabilities that we have so that we can continue to grow, enhance and scale. Great. It's an interesting approach because, as you said, prior, prioritization is key. We we kind of all know the the problems in the industry, where we're at, where we want to be. Um, but posts are very operationally driven organizations, and uh, to have it kind of set aside as someone else and some other joint venture is prioritizing a specific thing that you know you all need, uh, I think is a way a great way to to segment it and to make sure it stays a priority. Um, speaking of technology, as William hinted to, you can't really talk about cross-border e-commerce or trade without talking about the tech piece of it. And um, everyone wants to talk about AI these days, so I think it's appropriate to talk about it here and uh, what you're seeing as um, changes in how we can streamline these complex cross-border processes and how AI is currently helping with that and how that's changed over the last, uh, say, year because it is changing very rapidly. Rapidly. And whoever wants to take the question, and of course, if anyone from the audience wants to talk about that as well. Yeah, I think that yeah. AI is going to make cross-border easier for somebody who's not an expert in it. You know, we talk about how important data is, and you can have the data, but then it's how are you going to use it, and AI is the perfect way to be able to look at data, figure out how to use it, know all of the different, you know, once you have a specific customer or a specific product and what that looks like going into that certain country because it changes for each country, it changes all of the time. So being able to use AI to read the data and what to do with it to help you make better decisions, I think is gonna be really important. And once we grasp how to use AI for cross-border, then it will make it not so complicated for somebody who you know, isn't in it every single day. Thank you, I can mention that one example how the AI was uh, used now. 
uh, I mentioned a few times uh, data exchange. Uh, we have some kind of data set which was agreed between WCO, World Custom Organization, IATA, ICAO. Uh, this is the basic data set, but still more and more customs are, using, uh, are asking for more data. You mentioned HS codes, for example. And uh, uh, designated operators uh, sending uh, this customs data uh, sometimes are not using this HS code. This, this is not mandatory uh, according to the UPU uh, convention regulations. But thanks to uh, artificial intelligence, uh, European designated operators are using now uh, uh, tools which are able, based on the description of the goods, uh, uh, implement or give additional information, additional, for example, HS code uh, to, to give the customs. So uh, it helps a lot uh, uh, to be in more in compliance with all requirements, even if they are higher or more than, than uh, uh, in, in, in our international treaty. Yeah, I think a uh, faster assignment of these codes is definitely an advantage. And if anyone uh, has any more input on where they've seen uh, other advantages in streamlining processes with an AI and cross-border, Kate? Um, it's not actually AI, but I wanted to ask a question, so Great. I don't mean to change the um, uh, course here. But uh, Kate Muth from International Mailers Advisory Group. And I wanted to ask William if he's um, familiar uh, as, as a marketplace, if he's familiar with the Brazil um, Remesa Conforme e-commerce compliance program, but more generally what he thought of this idea of countries um, establishing e-commerce compliance programs where, uh, where marketplaces and others are certified and the standards are the same whether you come in through the postal channel or through the commercial channel, mm -hmm. um, you're, you know, everybody's got the same requirements. I was curious what, as a marketplace, you thought of that uh, direction. Thank okay. You. Okay. Sure. So I mean, really, a uh, very uh, important uh, uh, topic to to further discuss. I definitely noticed that uh, increasingly, as uh, the cross-border e-commerce are emerging, um, and uh, more and more countries are really establishing a more comprehensive framework to really uh, manage and also guide the development of e-commerce. I think that's critical. I mean, we noticed that, for example, uh, two years ago in Europe, we have the VAT reform, which really governed uh, the ongoing development of the cross-border e-commerce into Europe. And most recently in Brazil, I think they have uh, further uh, uh, regulations. I think we definitely, as an e-commerce logistics provider, we definitely welcome all those uh, um, um, new regulations because we, we definitely believe that all those regulations have actually guide the healthy development of the entire e-commerce and e-commerce logistics. Uh, from a, a pure uh, business and op operation perspective, we, we definitely want to see uh, even more healthy, uh, more sustainable development instead of like very rapid growth and then uh, there are quite a lot of um, kind of uh, um, uh, negative impact um, either to the local uh, small and medium business or some of the other uh, ecosystem players. So we definitely believe that cross-border e-commerce can be and should be a more sustainable business because it creates uh, the variety of assortments that uh, normally a pure local platform or local sellers cannot offer. And then throughout the entire uh, transaction, we make sure that the, the sellers uh, have a healthy platform to operate, uh, the buyers has uh, very good selections, very competitive price, and also very great experience. And also, as an e-commerce uh, logistics provider, uh, which works very, very closely with some of the leading uh, cross-border e-commerce platform, we really work very, very closely uh, on all those regulations. For example, we are uh, uh, the, the, the top players to really um, kind of uh, comply to the, uh, the, the VAT reform uh, in 2000. 21 in Europe, and also we are among the top uh, players right now. Already have our successful uh, processes uh, compliant to the new Brazil requirement. And we, regarding the volume, I think some of the near-term fluctuations might happen, but uh, on a more uh, mid to longer term, we definitely seen some very healthy behaviors and very healthy growth. 
uh, no matter what we are talking about Europe, right now our volume is even bigger than uh, what we used to have in 2021. And in Brazil, we definitely see that as uh, the, uh, the regulation is pr providing uh, a more comprehensive and, and healthy guidance to the overall development, we definitely see uh, the growth will be even more sustainable. And then we believe there are quite a significant uh, lead time and also even cost uh, advantages uh, by uh, complying to all those uh, new requirements. So we are very actively preparing for uh, new offerings uh, to really create even more differentiated services uh, toward our cross-border business, for example, in Brazil. Thank you. Uh, any other questions from the audience? Hi, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Paul Needham from CEP Research, uh, journalist specialized in the sector. Um, I have a question probably mostly for Jian Yao and uh, for NACO, SPL. Um, you're both, in a sense, you're both operating or wanting to operate sort of ecosystems for the logistics or for cross-border e-commerce. And um, UPU, of course, also has the ambition or the, the aim to set up some kind of a big global system. And there are other big names out there also operating, let's say, big ecosystems. So the question is, how many, how many ecosystems can the postal sector actually cope with? I mean, is, is there a role for several which would compete or collaborate or cooperate? How would it actually work? You know, everybody talks about it, but uh, would it actually work? Uh, I think I want to provide my quick answer to it. Uh, so I think um, def definitely different ecosystems plays uh, quite different roles. For us, when we talk about ecosystem, we are uh, talking about how we work together with uh, a lot of the partners, uh, especially in the last mile delivery and also cross-border line haul to better serve our customers. I think it's a very, very specific collaboration to make sure that we can create uh, the best end-to-end -end lead time and also uh, uh, cost and quality to our customers. So I think we are not in a position to set any like industry standards. We are really working very closely with all our partners to make sure that we can provide better services, better offerings. Uh, and um, by doing that, we believe that, uh, I, mean, I think this is also a, a earlier question that Amanda just mentioned, right? So uh, I think Chaniao uh, are only um, choosing some of the key uh, markets that we want to really develop uh, some of the deep operational capabilities. Because if we talk about cross-border, there are more than 200 countries globally. Uh, even for us, that we don't have enough resource and also capabilities to operate uh, only by ourselves in all of those countries. So we definitely have a very open-minded uh, operations and collaboration mentality to work very closely with uh, all the players and particularly a lot of the postal players uh, in a lot of the countries. But we definitely believe that it is not like a pure like arm length relationship. We, we definitely believe that by creating uh, uh, offerings and also the end-to-end -end experience that is uh, much better than uh, it used to be, I think it really empower uh, the consumers to have better experience and empower the platform and sellers to have even better business. So that's why we try to work very closely with all the partners to de define and collaboratively operate the next generation of networks. I think this is our definition of uh, how we see the, the ecosystem. We definitely believe, for example, like IATA, like uh, UPU um, as the global uh, 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 institutions, they have very sophisticated, uh, sophisticated uh, standards and there are a lot of things that we are really uh, looking forward to uh, to really uh, collaborate more. Thanks for that. And, uh, if I can maybe build on that from uh, from our perspective, the um, I think first of all, to start with the general premise, which is 
competition is always healthy, regardless of, of what we're specifically talking about. But uh, I think zooming in on this in particular, um, we are looking at the platform from a global uh, logistics supply chain end to end. Um, and when we talk about logistics, the world of logistics is, is, is very big and very vast, um, where um, postal is one part of it, um, but not necessarily everything else. So, um, so I think I, I just want to clarify that, that when we look at GN Tech and the platform, we're looking at you know a global logistics supply chain from end to end, and not specific to um, to just the, the the postal or the parcel perspective, but it can do so much more beyond that. Um, the the aspect is you know are we are we open to collaboration? Uh, absolutely, we're open to collaboration. That's the reason why we are we are collaborating with GN Tech to begin with. Um, is there um, room to, to be complementary to, to other platforms that are being developed, whether that's in, in, in Kainau or in the UPU? Um, I'm not necessarily the expert on, on both of those two systems, um, but you know, should there warrant um, and be, be an opportunity to complement or collaborate? Absolutely, we would, be, we would be very open to that. But I think at the end of the day, until, um, until a platform exists and is out there that people can actually plug into tomorrow, um, we should be focused on enabling the industry and the ecosystem and, and, and trying to get something out there sooner than later. So, um, you know, the first mover's advantage in terms of who's out there and who's ready uh, will have an advantage um, from, from an overall competitive market perspective. But, you know, should there be more than one player down the line um, and, and should there be an opportunity to collaborate and complement, absolutely, we are open, uh, open to those discussions and open to those, those collaborations. Great, thank you. All right, uh, we're at the end of our session now. So um, join me in thanking our wonderful panelists here today. Um, and we will continue in 15 minutes with uh, another strategy session on diversification. So come back and, uh, and let's talk about that again, uh, revisit it from the morning uh, session. Thank you. Thank you.